It's member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, and all things considered, we are in our Atherton Performing Arts Studio. I'm Dave Lawrence. Thank you very much for joining us. A lot of fun. Got these two cats. Um, I'm trying to remember when it was. It was last year at some point that the average white band rolled through town. They're back through Sunday at Blue Note, Hawaii. At that time, we had Alan Gorey, bassist, guitarist, vocalist, Ani McIntyre, guitarist and vocalist. We were hanging out at the Blue Note and uh, had a great conversation. I really enjoyed it, and it's a privilege to welcome both of them to our Atherton Performing Arts Studio. Welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thanks. Good to be here. It's yeah. Great, great again. to see you again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, nice to be in your studio. Yes. Change. We're changing uh, rooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Forget where we were. We were in the back room. The the green room, they call that. Oh, yeah. 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 What color it was, I can't remember. <laughs> you, you get colorblind in these clubs. And after the number of years that you've been doing it. Now, I'm holding this new uh, Inside Out which is the brand new, not in stores yet, so folks can't run out after they hear this and go try to find it. But this is, it seeds the mind for a few months yeah. down the road. And, and, and we've, we've brought uh, preview copies for audiences that come to the gigs. So it's, it's only right, really, that the live audience gets the first shot to listen to this stuff because they're the ones that really pay all our bills in the first place. It makes a lot of sense. And now this Harvest for the World, yeah. I, it was a few months back, I'm thinking it was May or June, that the studio version of that first made its way in, into reality. Isley Brothers classic. That's right. It was the end of mm-hmm. May. Right. Yeah. And it's got an Isley on it, too, I guess, to make yeah. it even more. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Yeah, that was... That Going was for a, authenticity. That was, good, that was a good hookup. Yes, it was. Talk about that, and, and maybe if you can, uh, I'm just wondering, and I could have it entirely wrong, but does that connection to the Isleys date all the way back to you know the, the earlier era of the band? Work yeah, to do? it does. I mean, our, our first trip to Los Angeles, first trip to America as a band, we'd only been formed a couple of months, and um, we were rehearsing, and uh, a friend of our managers, a guy called Bruce McCaskill, was working with um, Delaney and Bonnie, and then Bonnie went, independent went went solo and decided right. to do a solo album and he took the tapes from our rehearsal back to her and she said i've got to have them so she went to a m and and got them to to bring us over to the states to, to work on her first album so it was like a dream come true for us because suddenly we're in the middle of los angeles and, right. and, and you know a lot of talent in the middle of cats. a scene a whole scene where there was people popping in like the um, freddie stone from sly's band right. and, Oh, Bobby Womack popped in, you know, all sorts of people, Leon Ware, and it was it was, it was an amazing experience for us. It was, uh, and that's where you first... Well, that's where we first heard the Isley Brothers yeah. album, Brother, 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 Wow. upon which was Work To Do, which we then took and kind of made our, to a lot of people's knowledge, it, it became an AWB track. Right. Uh, in fact, oddly enough, we've just had a request from a French film company that are doing a thing about um, a first young cat that went into space for eight months and they're doing a, a, an IMAX thing about him and they want to use our version of work to do <laughs> as part of the soundtrack <laughs> for this IMAX uh, special. Wow. I just saw that email this morning. So our connection with the Isley Brothers, as Oni says, goes back to 72 the in beginning. Los Angeles to the, and it's to the beginning of the band. Yeah, and mean, it's going into space. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really incredible Perfect. thing, though, to have it come all the way back like that. And, uh, and a song yeah. like you chose. You did Harvest for the World. And this is a song that uh, comes from uh, 1976. I yes, guess. it's 76. And when you think about that tune, uh, I'm imagining, and you'll fill in the story, you kind of chose that maybe thematically as a, an important one to do right now. It was a favorite of um, Brent Carter's. Uh, he just wanted to do the song. Right, to do the vocals on that. Yeah, yeah. he's been um, wanting to sing it for years. and uh, Did he bring it to the... He brought the idea to us, oh, cool. and I was um, racking my brain for a, 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 a thought of how on earth you could do this tune. Uh, it's been done by Paul Carrick, it's been done by uh, Incognito, it's been done by a lot of people, and, but all of them have done it at the 120 BPM, beats per minute, uh, tempo. And um, I thought it needs to be done somehow differently, and I thought, well, we'll call Chris Jasper. He's a, a close neighbor of mine in Connecticut. So I just called him up out of the blue and said, how would you feel about revisiting your song, you know, that you and Ernie wrote and blah, blah, blah. And he said, let me think about it. And he was back to me within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. He said, why don't you come round to the house and we'll, we'll push it around. He said, I've got an idea. So I went round to his house and he's got a big studio in his basement. And um, he pressed the button and, and my God, the thing was almost done. You know, he had just, he'd put this, he'd, 
how he read my mind as to how it should be done. I didn't suggest him. He he's, he just basically came up with what might have been the best solution for how to revisit the song in this day and age, you know? That's fantastic. And and can I just ask a question, a sidetrack? Why is it so many cats want to live in Connecticut? Is it the proximity to the city? Is that the, <laughs> yes. Because everybody's It was tax-free. I don't know if it still is. Oh, no, no. Nothing's tax-free yeah, anymore. Say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But well, they get Unless, to move um, there and then you tax them. No, you, you're only tax-free if you're Apple, Google, um, and a few other large companies, you know. Uh, they're the only tax-free entities left on the planet. Where are you, where are you residing? I'm in the city, New York. Okay, so you're both we like, get ta- Yeah, we get really about, good tax. About a half yeah. hour from each other. You need to be a little... Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you it's, come a little closer to the mic? Not that I don't want you... I, I also want you closer to me, but I'll have Oh, ah, okay. There you go. Just for he's, a, he's in tax hell. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. We get taxed on everything. I believe it. Everything, and it's out of proportion to the rest of the state. So we basically, report, you know... Support the rest of the state. But anyway, that's how it is. But Shorter drive to get to the good here. bagels, though. That's oh, absolutely. Real easy. It's a walk, absolutely. actually. Absolutely. We can walk just about everywhere, which I love about it, actually. Yeah, me too. Um, so when did this, uh, thinking about places and regions, uh, and I just got this in my hand, so that's why I don't have all the details on when it was done. Where where'd you record this thing? We did it all in um, New York State and in Connecticut, um, and um, close to home. It's just finished. I mean, really, we 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 went fin- finished that on like a Sunday. Went on tour to Europe on the Monday, literally, and um, it's uh, th- this is the first copies we've we've seen of it here. This is the first box opened in the United States. Wow! Even though we're in the mid Pacific. It's still in the United States. Yeah, yeah. As the <laughs> airline told us when we flashed our passports, they said, no, no, this is a domestic flight. <laughs> so we said, oh, so that's no free bagels, no blankets, <laughs> no cushions. Right, that extra <laughs> level of comfort yeah. denied. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, and it follows AWB R&B. Right. So in my, in my mind, I'm just curious, what makes a couple cats like yourselves want to do back-to-back live records so quick? Well, it proves that we're... Alive and well, right. you know. It's a reminder. It's a reminder. We're still here. We're still look. here. Uh, no, it's, it's the only way to let the big audience that doesn't come to the gigs know that you're still here. Okay, is to put records out, um, and first of all, to have the um, have the the impetus to to, to put records out yeah. because it's pretty easy just to sit there in between live gigs and do nothing. Yep. But that's not how the guys in the band tick. You studio know? version of the tune with Chris on here. Yes, studio versions of that. A cover of uh, James Taylor's uh, Shower the People that we've oh. all loved forever. And that's a studio too. That's a studio one. And a couple of other tunes, one that I wrote and one that a great friend of ours, um, Michael Mara, a Scottish poet, wrote. So there's four, there's like an EP's worth of studio tracks that are all new. And then eight live tracks with big band, with the horn arrangements, literally from the White Album, Feel No Fret, Cut wow. the Cake and all that. We um, we imported a, a horn section of good friends in, in from New York, so we we did a live eight tune set with them. So it's a, it's a that's why it's called Inside Out, right? Because he's got a little bit of each yeah. on that. And and in this era of uh, this digital revolution, I don't know what you want to call it. When you think about uh, the consumption of this stuff, because I'm I'm already learning. I call it digital devolution. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> People are becoming devolved in the in the kind of uh, interactive sense. It, it is a de uh, a de evolution in in some ways. The uh, when it, it, folks are going to be buying because I'm thinking of your fir- of your previous answer, which is as I'm speaking, which is this is. You're, you're reminding people you're there. You're g- showing them you're still busy when you're not on the tour. Is it really going to be something they buy a physical copy of at the show as opposed to getting a digital download of? Or both? They, they would rather, both. They would, yeah, both, but they would rather buy it at the show. Right, okay. Because also we go and meet them afterwards sign and sign it, a copy. Becomes so a nice it becomes souvenir. a nice It becomes a personalized souvenir. Got a it. reason to actually have a, a physical copy. Right, it makes a good, right, exactly. It creates a reason. Hey, yeah. there's a good reason to get this. You buy it, you're going to meet us after the show, we're going to sign but, it. A lot of the same tunes are on the, on the CD that, that they've heard live, so there's a connect, serious connection there. Right. Which was the reason we, we did live, started doing live albums in the first place. It was really people that came to the shows and said, "Well, can I get you know? Did you rec- you know? Can we buy a recording of tonight?" So it, it comes from that basically. Uh, our, our fans really wanted to hear live <clears throat> versions of the of the songs. And a lot of groups, uh, you guys have a real nice studio. Um, like I was going to say, some bands, it's almost like they come alive more in concert than on their records. I mean, but you guys, to me. 
I would say it's a little bit of both because I love the studio sound. There's something nice and crystal yeah. clear. There's yeah. a warmth, maybe like a Steely Dan Floyd esque. It's warmth. a totally different approach. Right, it right. really is. It's very, very different, and it takes a different kind of headspace to get into the studio way of working it can be very intimidating right and then some bands just they just sound entirely it's like the thing that that draws people to them can be more represented by their live show it depends really i guess now that i'm thinking about it that's one of the neat things about you guys having seen you live and appreciating the classic music you you kind of cover cover both bases and Mm -hmm. since that thinking about last time that we were uh, and when was that was that the fall of it was october um, of 2016 2016 all right a little over a year then Mm -hmm. and since we last talked um a major cat passed on and in studying you guys i don't know if we did talk about it last time forgive me i can't remember everything we talked about but i know ani at least got the chance to record with chuck chuck berry oh and god it he, keeps coming up you of know. course it's gonna it's one of those things and especially when he passed away earlier this year it was it was one of those things and i, I kept getting bbc called up a lot and asked me for you know quotes and parts of uh, interviews <laughs> and stuff and was, my ding-a-ling i know and but <laughs> but the irony is it was part of a live album. Right. We were asked to do, Robbie and I were asked to do um, a live show. Just to back him. Yeah, just to back him. I was At with, one I was, I was with a band, but they didn't want exactly the same lineup as the band, so they wanted to bring in a couple of other people, which they did. And I asked Robbie. And, um, but there was absolutely no rehearsal before the, before the show, and Robbie didn't, I mean, he wouldn't play anything unless he knew exactly what the arrangement was. Right. He kept saying, Chuck, what's the arrangement? <laughs> Eddie, Eddie, can you arrangement? You know? What is it? And Chuck's going, when I do this, you start. When I do that, you stop. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it real simple. <laughs> Because if you've ever, anyone who's ever seen or doesn't, maybe a lot of people, I guess to fill in a little context, Chuck Berry notoriously shows up to a gig and has pickup musicians for that show. So Chuck yeah. didn't bring a band around. He turned up in his stage clothes right. with a guitar. <laughs> right, in his briefcase with a... No, oh, not even that. He no. put the money in his pocket. Oh, no. I like that. That's and good. he wouldn't go on until he had the money in his pocket. <laughs> so if you, if you look at the photographs closely, you'll see this bulge. <laughs> And that's what that is. It's yeah. not an early cell phone. That's his packet of money. I it like is. It. So uh, you uh, remember him walking in? Like, tell, tell that story for him. You're sitting there. You, did you show up before him? or? Oh, yeah, we were there early because we had to, you know, we were already doing a set with the band I was with at the time. And then uh, we were hanging around and we changed the equipment for, for him coming on. And then we got it all set up, you know. And then we were standing there, and, and Chuck walks in, and he comes right over and he introduces himself. And I went, hey, hi, Chuck. That was, Honour to meet you, man. You know, I'm on it. He went, you, guitar. <laughs> he didn't want to know my name or anything. Your guitar. And he did the same with everybody else. I was like, <laughs> and Robbie's like sitting there going, you know, making faces and like, look, look, what the, f-, you know. <laughs> I love it. I mean, Robbie was a consummate professional. Right, I mean, and he absolutely. put you in an awkward spot by not letting you rehearse at all, and then you're oh, going to yeah. be with this legendary yeah, but, guy. You know, well, we just, and his, his take on it was he used to, Look, I'm Chuck Berry. You're supposed to know all these songs. Exactly. What's the problem? I'll give you the key, and I'll tell you when to start and stop, and that's it. What's the there rest to rehearse? Yeah. You know. <laughs> exactly. What's wrong with this picture exactly. you're saying, and they're getting easy, he's going, nothing. You know? <laughs> I can imagine it. But no, he was a tough customer. Having said that, I mean, what a showman. I mean, what an education in showmanship. He led the entire audience. You listen to the album version of My ding and ling and you hear him, he, he rules the whole thing. He gets everybody on his side, and we just had to kind of stand there. And I don't think we even actually played on it, maybe a couple of notes here right, and there. Right. And, he, and listen to the performance and how he gets the whole audience going. And then he finished up with reeling and rocking. Oh, he knew how to do it. And, and yeah. Oh, know, he totally knew how to do it. What a professional. I mean, and as far as showmanship goes, but the other stuff... Was the musical stuff was he'd be playing like 11 and a half bars instead of 12 bars and 14 yeah. bars instead of 12, you know. And his guitar was all out of tune and everything, but it didn't seem to matter because it was the energy yeah, right. and, and the audience reaction. There was so many people there that um, a, a couple of well-known English journalists were on stage and they were making so much noise that they had to... They couldn't use some of the recordings because of the stage noise, because of the because of the audience noise and the stage noise, and, and um, so then they decided they were going to do some um, studio tracks. So they ended up doing, I believe it was four tracks, funnily enough, yeah. same as us. But anyway, 
Um, I wasn't available. I couldn't do it. We had a show the next day in Bristol or somewhere. I couldn't go. They, the, his manager was there with the recording, the, the Pi mobile recording studio oh, right. was parked outside. Pi, now there's a name to conjure with. P-Y-E. P-Y-E. Big right. British label. Yeah, I know, the, I know it. I haven't heard it in a long time. And they were the one Kinks of the first. on Pi. Wow. I'd they were one of the first with a, a mobile uh, um, unit, to, unit yeah, yeah. go and record. Yeah. So. And, um, and he came out and he asked, are you available tomorrow? And said, no, no. And, and Robbie, it didn't matter if he was available or not. He wasn't doing it. Right. <laughs> he had uh, had enough. Uh, which was a pity, actually, in a way. <laughs> Although, studio, um, obviously, Chuck would have been in the studio. But um, they had Dean with Lagan from The Faces and, oh, wow. and, and a couple of a couple of Heavy these guys. Cats. They were good, yeah, good guys. Uh, Kenny Jones was on drums. Yeah. Later joined The Who. Right. You, you never... Uh... So I, did, I wasn't involved in that, unfortunately. I mean, at least I would have get paid more, I think. Right. <laughs> I mean, although you never know. But it's good memories. I mean, it's a heavy oh, memory. Oh, it was, it was a fanta- amazing experience. It really was. And when it's over, he's, he's toast, he's out of there, he's got the money. I never saw him after that. He walked like, off stage later. and that was it. Right. Apparently yeah. he went straight off stage into a car and back to his hotel. That's with Mr. his guitar right. and his money, that was it. That's how he does it. And you never saw him again in your uh, in your life. No, and that was it. When when we think about this incredible encounter that your uh, lifelong friend, touring partner ha- has uh, in his in his uh, feather in his cap, I guess. Think of some of the cats, because one of the questions I was wondering uh, about both of you in the early years, you get started really quick. You're discovered by heavy people. Who are some of the really important people that you met or got to tour with, maybe as an opener in those beginning years as you were establishing yourself? And maybe any just a fun interaction, like the way that Ani was re- reflecting yeah, on Chuck, just yeah. something that came across. Um, I don't think I ever had any of that. That's why I just hold that against him. I was, <laughs> I was, I was, resent, resentment's amazing. <laughs> and you can hold a grudge. We all can't hang with Chuck Berry. It's true. Um, Les McCann. Well, I would say the people that impressed me the most were the opening acts that we had, were like uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, the Whoa. Commodores. Whoa. Um, they're opening for Average White Band. And, um, the and Commodores. We, yeah, the Commodores are opening for Average White Band in 1975 because we've got the number one hit. And uh, that's how the business uh, goes. Uh, you, you, you're top of the bill one week and then the other other guys top of the bill Lionel the Richie week. warming up for you yes yeah he was in the Commodores at that time and um, I know you can't believe that stuff. Know, it, and and Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes with Teddy Pendergrass oh my. so we we're standing in the in, in, in the wings watching all this going on and um, you know we've got to go on after them and they're consummate showmen because they've been doing the chitlin circuit right. since they were 10 years old and they know exactly how to as work, says, work it yep. work the audience do the whole thing and we know we've got to go on after them with very little experience, but we have a number one hit record. That's all we have, we think, you know. However, once we got on stage after seeing these guys, it did it put some lead in our pencil. It did something to the band. Um, as Mick Jagger said, watching uh, Tina Turner told him, showed him very how quickly to how to do it, how to be a showman, how to, how to turn being a, a club band singer into being a big stage arena act. A, act yeah. So the, these are the things that impressed me. Les McCann was another one. If we're talking about an instrumentalist, a giant instrumentalist, we got to know him really well. And, and you know, a few other uh, people in that realm that um, were, were not really such big crowd pleasers, but they were... You know, like the the Brecker brothers, uh, Mike and Randy, who ended up uh, playing who, who on several played records. on several of our albums. Yeah. Dave Sanborn, uh, people of that ilk, you know, who were who were just idols of ours as musicians, and we got to we got to hire them on our records, and they became friends, and we hung out with them and uh, learned an, an enormous amount from these guys. So it, it was a, a real quid pro quo thing, because I think they learned a lot from us as well in the fact that we could do things as, as dumbly and simply as we did. For example, pick up the pieces. Um, when the Brecker brothers tried to write their pick up the pieces, they did sneaking up behind you. Mm. And um, as Gene Paul, our engineer at Atlantic, says, he says, but they went and stuck that dumb middle bit from the music school in. And, and they <laughs> from did. the music school? Yeah. He, he says the dumb bit from the music school. They went and put that in the middle of their um, version, which killed it. Right. In um, other words, it was too, it was too, too musical. musical. It was too clever. Whereas ours has two chords. It has the one chord and the four chords. Keep it simple, stupid, they it, say. Yeah, K-I-S-S. It's a good you know? theory. And uh, so they, they, I think they, they got a little of that something from us because we were kind of um, musical mutts. We all learned by ear. You know, we weren't schooled guys at all. Whereas these, 
cats were talking about, they were all consummately educated. And that can interfere is what we're pointing out. Well, it can. It can, inter- yeah, it can, it can interfere things. with writing because sometimes you're, you're, um, what you hear in your head and your gut instinct is the best thing to go with right. rather than what's necessarily correct theoretically. That's difficult to do if you've had uh, too much schooling rammed into you, you know? Look you, at James Brown. If you, if you analyse most of his material, oh. theoretically it's wrong. Right, no, it was that energy, it was this, I mean, there was... It's the energy and it's the crowd reaction and it's just, and, and it's played with such conviction. Plus he's There's a no sort of... It just plows through everything. That's an unusual one there too with JB because you're talking about, he also had a, just a physical thing, just the way he would move was music. I mean, it yeah. was yeah. only Michael Jackson, who can I think of, that comes close to having like the... the yeah. the, the full circle effect of that. And on he was a cat I was curious about. So you named some... Really cool how you learned, it was people that you, you learned from. I like your answer to that question. But when you think of JB, George Clinton. Those well, I mean, James was a huge influence on us as well. Right. And the JBs paid tribute to you in, the, yeah, in that yeah, way. Right. Yeah. Did you actually get to interact with the Godfather ever? I did. Um, Hamish and I went down um, when James was kind of down in his luck a little bit. He was playing small clubs and he played, um, at the, I played in New York. Um, and. Uh, was it the Lone Star Cafe? Lone Star Cafe, wow, yeah. yeah. On Fifth Avenue, believe it or not. Um, it was an old Art Deco building. It was brilliant. And I saw so many people there. But he was there, and we went up and hung out at the bar, and, and the guys came out. And, and they wow. were going, oh, man, it's so great to you know, meet you guys. And James came out, and he was very, very nice, and you know, very appreciative and you know, complimentary, I should say. Um, but then we hung out with the guys, and they were saying, when Pick Up the Pieces came out, people kept going up to them and said, oh, God, I love that new single you've got. Oh. <laughs> you know? This is the JBs. Yeah, yeah, and they're like, no, that's not our new and single. And, and they, were going, they were going, it ain't us. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bunch of Scottish guys. I know. <laughs> a bunch of guys from Scotland. <laughs> Can you imagine? And that thing had that groove that I could understand. That came from James. Exactly. That all, that's that what I mean. People, James. people yeah. listening on the radio would have never have, have known. I mean, that was part of the magic of the band. Well, too. We, we wrote it as a tribute to the JBs. We really did. Uh, it was, that was in our minds the day that that tune came about at Karen Shearer's place. Yes, it was. It was, it was in our heads that we were doing our tribute to the JBs. And all we thought about that tune was, I can't wait. We couldn't wait to get back to our crowd at the Marquee in London and, and play this to them. They'll, wow. they'll, they'll, this will blow them away, you know, us, us doing the JBs to a T. And uh, that was all that was in our heads. No one ever thought it would be a single or a, anything Career that important. Defined. Never. No, it was, Never. it was just something that we wanted to put on our record for our own gratification and in our style, you know. Oh, and it's and it is your style, and it became a, a, a good example of your style, and not something derivative, quite frankly. Yeah, just as well it did, you right. know, because it, mm-hmm. it's good. It, it's it's always good luck to be defined by something that really is in and of yourself, right. rather than something pretentious. Right. Yeah. That then it's almost impossible to come up with a second one after yeah. that. Well, I mean, it is once you have that. <laughs> as we kind found of, out. Yeah. Right. Well, well you, I think cut the cake was probably the closest. It was as close as we could get because it was semi instrumental, um, had a little bit of lyric in it, such as the lyric is it's all tongue in cheek yeah, stuff yeah. you know but uh, that's okay because that's r and b it doesn't it doesn't have to be always meaningful deep and um, and philosophical, philosophical. Yeah, yeah that's right yeah. so you know it's 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 good that it was a, a real honest thing that that um, stuck to the wall first because as you say it's pretty difficult to follow up a lie yeah um Unless you're the president, but... Oh, sorry. Oh, oh don't sorry. go there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't say which one. This is true. I didn't say Robert Mugabe. <laughs> <laughs> one might have assumptions. Um, you mentioned Gene Paul, uh, and it probably slipped by folks listening, and that's okay. Um, the uh, son of Les, Les Paul. Yes. Did he ever come in, and you ever run into, into his famous father as part of his... Yeah, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a few times, because um, there was a couple of um, Atlantic events, like the Atlantic right. 40th... 77 and 88, I and guess. And 88. Both. He, was, he came in to, uh, you know, to the festivities and wow. you know introduced himself the lovely guy yeah you know, just that's a very heard. great musician and just a great guy and funny i mean he was funny i had uh al di miola on recently and um he's a great storyteller that dude i mean yeah. if he once once he's done playing guitar he could just go around and tell stories because he's got that new york accent too which is great. really fun yeah. he was telling about less how less would come over to his house 
and get down on the floor and look up at his guitar to see his picking technique. And he was just telling this whole story about how, you know, Les couldn't, you know, quite get over that and just the bonding of, of those characters. And he pointed out the same thing, that what a really uh, disarming, kind, gentle sort of cat yeah. Yeah. Uh, he is. And you mentioned those those gigs. I guess those are important. I know that we didn't last time we had uh, the time to the pleasure of talking we did not talk about that atlantic show but before we do the 88 one the one in 77 in montreux does that stand is that even close i mean and I, I know they're very different the one in 88 madison square garden all-star kind of jam it's very different than than the all-stars gig in montreux with atlantic but any memories of that 77 one that just stick out oh many many yeah. great memories well that that was our first introduction to um a should we say a combined artillery of so many great musicians in one live setting um, from the same label, from the same record company. I mean, it was the first time it's been done, I think, since the Motown shows, mm -hmm. except this was more of a jazz or well, jazz festival, Montreux Jazz Herbie Festival. Herbie Mann was one of them. Herbie Mann was, was responsible for getting it all together. It was his, it was his brainchild to put the Atlantic All-Stars together. Even though a couple of people like the Brecker brothers were, were no longer on the Atlantic label, it doesn't matter. They were on enough Atlantic records. Right, to and, count. And, and part of our kind of family. Uh, coterie and family. Exactly. So it was the Atlantic family live at Montreux. Which Who else? Was, um, well, there was Don Ellis right, Don and Ellis. Um, F David Fathead Newman. Right. There was Richard T. There was uh, Sammy Figueroa on percussion. There was uh, all of us, of course. Benny King. Um, and you had just done the Benny and Us record. Yes, or that's yeah. right. That's correct. Jim Mullen and Dick Morrissey, who had just signed to a subsidiary of Atlantic at that time. Who, who are known in Britain. Well, known in Britain and had you ever done here. that gig, the Montreux, before? No, never. no. And never it was be, part of the festival. Never even been there. Okay. No. But yeah. this was just like, a, this was a special thing at a the one, festival. A one-off thing at the Montreux one Jazz off. Festival. Okay. It was a whole weekend of the Atlantic family live at Montreux. But I dig how you described it. Very different entire. And you painted an awesome picture. That's That, that was a good explanation. So it was much more jazz heavy. It was more music heavy. It was about the, the music. And, and, and when you have it at a, at a jazz festival, very different than when you rent out the most famous arena in the world and you have Led Zeppelin reunite with Jason Bonham on drums for the first time and I still remember being a kid in my my Hyundai Excel driving around listening to the recording of that I could almost not contain myself listening to them do Kashmir getting yeah. excited just thinking about it but what an all-star lineup talk, talk yeah. about well, the, the thing and the thing about Montreal was that we were, it was interactive we were playing these guys they all come on and played with with for, us, with us, we, we were the, we were the nucleus for the whole right. thing. You they, were the they we, made, based we, it we all around the, you. We were the rhythm section, right. an, an augmented rhythm section, of course, with Sammy and Richard T. But um, the 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 thing is that the AWB had we we had qualified by then. Arif Martin had uh, stamped our credentials on the certificate and said, "Yeah, these guys are ready to do this. We we can handle it." You know, so they could put all the heavyweights around us. Perfect. And. Um, we didn't feel. We honestly didn't feel any pressure. We we were ready. We, we, by that point. By that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was when we kind of finally knew we'd arrived as musicians to be um, to be honoured enough to be thrown into that deep end. Was uh, Amit there? Amit, uh, no, Nezui was there. Okay. Um, Amit was there for one afternoon. I don't know what was happening. I think he was on his way to. Um, Another honor somewhere. And then by '88, was he at that thing too? Oh yes. Yeah. And, and at that and, uh, and well, that was that was oh, the, yeah, that was, that was the 40th so. anniversary of Atlantic Records. Did you watch so. those other bands? Did you watch? Oh yeah, that yeah, band? we were there all Crosby, day. Crosby, Stills, and Nash were amazing. They were they were they were stupendous. They were really yeah. fantastic. Yeah, a wonderful act. There were a lot of great things. Um, you know, um, when somebody didn't turn up for their 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 allotted 20 minute set. Um, not not John Belushi, his partner Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd, Aykroyd got up and filled in the twenty minute gap. And he was Brilliant. hilarious. He was hilarious. I'm sure. And he's I, I doubt he'd ever spoken to a crowd that size before right. in Madison Square Garden. But he just he just ad libbed twenty minutes of sheer genius. And what a wild, uh, a real diverse lineup because quite different than the one in '77. This was kind of like all the different flavors of Atlantic yeah. In, yeah. in some ways, yeah. from jazz to rock and roll, right, right, and, and everything in between. Who, did Zeppelin finish? Was that the last set of the night? Was it, it was. Yeah. Okay. And was it, um, and I know it's a strange question, but because I've been in Madison Square Garden a lot and seen some pretty outrageous things in there. Did, was it like really late at night, like past the curfew kind it of? It was past my bedtime. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that tells us a lot. <laughs> I was in the bar. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was. 
You watched though when they played. Watched I saw, some of saw watched the beginning. Some of the set. I didn't yeah. see all, Manhattan all the transfer. Because you remember we're, we're mixing with people. Yeah, you were busy for yeah. years behind stage. You were so. socializing. Yeah, you're at the bar. You well, we're hanging King out with hanging out with Booker T and the MGs. It's particularly Duck Dunn. The oh, Duck Dunn's hilarious. hilarious. Magic guy, lovely. We're hanging out with these guys, Sam Moore. Uh, you know, it was just a, a crazy getting to know you session. So there wasn't a great deal of time spent going back into the auditorium and, and watching everything that people did. Right. And we'd, we'd all been there since 11 in the morning and it's now, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, with, it was with a long day. A long <laughs> day, <laughs> yeah. And we were thirsty, <laughs> as Scotsmen do. Right, that's not a surprise to anybody. Um, and the very next year was a big one for you guys, too. Uh, Aftershock, I would say your most all-star affair. Um, I mean, I, I, you've had a lot of great stuff, but the entire o Ohio players, is, or how many of the Ohio uh, players? Four of them. Billy four. Bonds, um, Be Billy Beck, sorry. Um, Oh, no, the names are going to escape me. Here. Diamond Williams. Diamond was there, yeah. <laughs> Everybody but Sugar. Ah. Oh. Um, who by then was a little, I think, tired and emotional. Sugarfoot. Yeah. Uh, monster. Uh, and Ronnie Law, Shaka Khan, Alex Desertwood, yep. his co fellow countrymen, is that how you say Yeah, yeah, pulled in with people that we knew and, and, and who was available, you know. At, a genius, at a genius we vocalist. We were in Seattle at the time, so. You were in Seattle? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. You guys were based out of Seattle? No, we were doing the album in Seattle okay, that's for a record recording. company based there, which didn't last very long, the record company. How know. did you, why get, how did all those cats coalesce on that one thing? Well, they were, they were signed to the same label. That's what it is, so label yeah. mates. And of course, um, R Ronnie Laws is a Seattle native, um, and Al Hendricks, Jimmy's dad, was there at a couple of the sessions wow. with, his, with his new girlfriend on his knee. He was hanging out. He was, <laughs> hanging he was lovely. Out. Just yeah, guy. lovely guy, yeah. really. Uh, Al, uh, that was one of the great experiences of my life, uh, being on the in the in the wings when Jimi Hendrix played his first big London concert. I had the the luck to be there with Robbie McIntosh, who was playing in the other band back in Garnet Mims, a, a black soul artist from the states. So like opening for Jimmy, yeah, opening for so Jimmy. You were backstage, so I was backstage with Robbie and got to see Jimmy up close doing his thing for the first time on the big stage, you know, in London. And what venue again? Savile Theatre, wow. which Brian um, Epstein had um, rented for the season to put on some concerts. It was a Sunday night thing. Beatles manager. Yeah. yeah. And, and, the, um, and all the Beatles were there in the audience and Stones and everybody. So, I mean, it was a who's who of British... Uh, it was his very first big show. First big show, yeah. And you, ever, you get to interact with him at all? No, no, nobody did. I mean, he came in. Um, I spoke to Mitch briefly and I spoke to... Um, no. No. Quite a bit, actually. But Jimmy just came in and kind of, all right, everybody, blah, 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 went into it and went, went away out the back door, like Chuck Berry. <laughs> what? Brushes with huge stuff over the course of... Yeah, uh, he was amazing, uh, Hendrix. And uh, we, get, we didn't mention him very much, but Ronnie Laws, I always dug that. What was that, Prush, the 1975 record with the egg that, that had always there? Or, yeah. Um, uh, pressure sensitive mm, or pressure... It's too early to throw names know, at us. But, but that's, you know the record I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. So just hearing his name, I just had... Well, to, both the brothers, Hubert and Ronnie, are just yeah. uh, Monster, amazing Monster players. Monster musicians. Yeah. Yeah. Monster yeah. musicians. All right, and as we go to wrap it up with you cats uh, and, and get you ready for, for your big show, just two final questions here. Uh, we were, we've been, uh, again, talking about this new live record, which is not available unless you're coming to the show. So you're going to have it on sale, though, for the folks? Or Correct. Yes. So yeah. they will have, so if you go down to the Blue Note, you'll have a chance to see it. Inside Out is the record. Back in 80, 88, was, I forget the year it was done, but the Fillmore, the face-to-face -face record that you did at the actual, the original yeah. Fillmore yeah. Auditorium yep. in San Francisco, and it made me just wonder, over all those years of doing the Bay Area, Billy Graham, Bill Graham stories, anything, anything come to mind? Any fun encounters with him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't play that much in, in San Francisco. No, we were yeah. never, we were never one, of their, one of their circuit or rota of bands. But the one, the one big show he did put on with us uh, in 75 or early 76 was at the Winterland, which was the big skating arena. arena. Um, and um, it should have been a, a triumphant night for us because we were, we were riding high. But uh, for some reason or other, the, the, the crew, Bill Graham's crew, um, we realized just how stoned they were when we spent all of the sound check listening to White Noise, man. Um, and, and this is how the day went. So by the time we got on stage, things were... He does that <laughs> voice so good. White Noise, man. Weren't, they weren't in the best temper, shall we say, between the band and the crew. 
And I I started the set singing, and uh, there was nothing coming out of my monitors, so I made the usual signals. You know, could I have some voice in my monitor, please? And nothing was <laughs> nothing was happening. It was getting you know we'd gone now in the second tune, in in a break in the tune I I went over and I said to the the, the monitor guy who was kind of like laughing and goofing around and everything. I said so he made the mistake of leaning over the monitor board, and I just gave him a Glasgow kiss, you know. And, I headbutted him basically, and uh, he went backwards over the thing, and I went back on stage. But needless to say, my monitor got turned on. But we never worked for Bill Graham again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the long and short of that story. My um, my moment of triumph was a, a disaster for the band, uh, creatively with Bill Graham. Yeah, he didn't take real kindly to stuff like that. No, either. he didn't. If you if you weren't under his thrall or in his fist, you know, he didn't. You didn't work for Bill at or all. Or conflicts like that, because I always remember the Zeppelin one that happened backstage with his. Because uh, I remember um, they were doing the day on the green. You know that story, Zeppelin. No, were, Zeppelin no. were Zeppelin and Judas Priest doing um, the stadium. So the Oakland Stadium, Bill would do these shows annually called the Day on the Green, and he'd put. Bands, yeah. that, you know, mix mix bands together. That that bill sounds a little more like it makes sense, but sometimes it'd be pretty eccentric bands. But anyway, um, backstage, Jason Bonham, John's son, was young and running around, and somehow he um, got disciplined by one of Bill's employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Zeppelin people did not like that. And um, Peter Grant, I guess, mm -hmm. was his name. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and Richard Cole and. Yep. I guess John Binden I, was the oh, oh, John <laughs> Binden. Oh, my <laughs> word. What a triumvirate oh. of thugs. Right? So now you know what I'm talking about. Oh, so, I do. So John Bonham, uh, because it was his kid, Binden, and, um, and Peter Grant go looking for the Graham employee who got wind of it, and he went and hid in a trailer. And Bill Graham was trying to guard the door. And uh, Peter Grant was, uh, said something like, we're not going to hurt him. We just want to talk to him. And, and somehow, somehow Bill allowed them in there. Guy had to have, I mean, it was like emergency surgery to try yeah. to save this employee of Bill's. And then Bill took it out on the band. He tried to stop the next night. Um, and I forget how it ended up happening. He made the show go on because they put him in a weird spot. But just reminds me of how back... I thought you were going to say they put him in a wheelchair. No. <laughs> well, the employee it it was... Yeah, it yeah. wouldn't surprise me. These guys, um, they had a saying, he'll be held while I talk to him, you know. Um, Binden, that's the way yeah. they would talk. Yeah, we, we were on the roads, John Binden. He was, uh, he was road managing for, Lovely guy. for Kokomo when they opened for our first headline tour. And um, John Binden, what a hilarious character and uh, a, a real first-class um, bruiser. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah, you wouldn't want to mix it with him. No, I believe it. No, no, no. He, I totally he believe could it. go on with him. He was, oh, he was, was funny. Nice guy. Yeah, and funny. You know? Well, all these guys are. It's the same as it's like the, the Cosa Nostra, the mafia in New York. They're hilarious guys if you get to know them. And they will, charisma. They will take care of musicians if you're okay with them because we're not a threat to them. They'll make sure you get paid, and they'll make sure nobody hurts you or gets in your way. But don't ever cross them in, in their business, in right. their world. You know. Well, that was always the story with the Zeppelin guys. Because yeah. I remember working. Well, Peter Grant's a known... Oh. Exactly. Uh, and that kind of incident would happen wherever they went. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm sure... I think, I think he attracted it like a magnet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he was a bit of a, a shit magnet. And your final question, uh, you guys have been... Steve, the mystery emailer, sends me stuff from uh, bands, <laughs> bands past. Sends useful, because it's, it's stuff like your day. April 25th, 1975, Blaze Del Arena with a 20-minute pick up the pieces. Listen to these tickets. Is that prices. all? 20 minutes? Can you believe it? You were doing a, br a brief one. You were yeah. editing it. The, 650, top ticket, 550, and 450. I know. And now that's like Isn't a, that amazing? That's the service charge now for a ticket. <laughs> yeah, that's parking. No, 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 that's not even parking. Right, that's a portion of parking. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful memories because uh, we, Oni and I were talking about that yesterday. We both still got our, our wooden fruit bowl from Tom Moffat. Oh, wow. Uh, inscribed, you know, uh, aloha and mahalo. Hawaii loves you. I'm still looking for this girl, Hawaii. If anyone knows where she is, she loves me. But he sent us these bowls, and I guess he sent them to every band. You but know, it's a nice the, souvenir. It's a nice no, souvenir. Yeah. 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 I've still great, got mine. It's a great. Do you have yours, Oni? I've still got, I was telling Alan, something happened and it got burnt. No, I, I don't know. You're left. not supposed to put it in the toast. Yeah, <laughs> next to, an, next to a candle or something. It. However, it was irreparable. However, I took the the brass nameplate. Yeah, you have that. You know, yeah. and I still have that. Yeah, it's a great I, the idea was to put it onto another bowl. You know. And but, Tom, if you're listening, we say we love you too. It, oh, was, it was great yeah, to work thanks, for Tom. Tom. It was wonderful. He was our first benefactor here. And you know, he passed. No. 
No. Oh, we didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I thought you were speaking to him in the ether, which is just well, as appropriate. Well, that's fine. Oh, that's that's just as appropriate. Now. Exactly. I'm, I'm fed up with people passing. Yeah. Uh, no. We've we, lost a lot of uh, uh, really good people recently, in the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. Uh, we lost. I forget exactly when, because as oh, you just said, we lost so many. It's, I think he was around last year. Could have been. Because he, he was in Polestar at some event. I can't other. remember when it happened, because as you pointed yeah, out, we've been losing a whole yeah, lot of cats. Sorry to yeah. hear that. Really. No, yeah, really. But you have a great souvenir from it, and I think that's cool that you can remember. Well, now, now it's even more important. Exactly. Absolutely. Now you know. I won't Keep burn that brass mine. thing. I won't I'm going to buy it. Yeah, you won't burn yours, and you'll mount yours on something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick a, up a bowl before I leave, so at least it's from here. Yeah, that's a great I'm idea. Happy no. Look I'm happy to know. I'm going to do that. I love that kind of talk. It's Average White Band, and uh, they're through Sunday Blue Note Hawaii. We've been thrilled to have Alan Gorey and Ani McIntyre, original members of the band, back and uh, in our Atherton Performing Arts Studio. I hope you had fun. I had a lot of fun. Yes, I'm sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Very grateful Thanks, to have you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having us again. And um, hallelujah for NPR. It's, it's the only radio I listen to.